John the Apostle lived his life as a disciple of the one who embodied such love. He lived as a disciple of the one who loved the Father with every fiber of his being, even laying down his life as the atoning sacrifice. And he lived as one who loved his neighbor as himself. If you want to know what love is, you can read 1 Corinthians 13, a beautiful description of love. But you can also look at the life of Jesus. Jesus spoke truth. Sometimes he had to rebuke those he loved, as in that incident with James and John and calling down fire from heaven. I think sometimes in our day and age we have, we have fluffed up love a little too much. We have forgotten that sometimes love has to do what's hard and difficult in order to be loving. Just as a parent who disciplines a child whom they love. But love is also a very good thing, for love is sacrificial. Jesus says, when you love, I want you to love as I have loved you. Give it all. Give your all. The late Lutheran commentator Richard Linsky defines the love of God, agape love, this kind of love, this way. Love always seeks the well-being of the beloved. Love just seeks the well-being of the beloved. And so when you say, I love my neighbor, do you seek your neighbor's well-being? Is that what you're after? Well, I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 John, that little letter toward the back of your New Testaments. 1 John this apostle of love, late now in his life, an elderly man, pens this letter. He has to deal with some tough issues. He deals with the, the need for holiness and eradicating sin in our lives. He deals with false teaching and those who, who would lead you away from Jesus. But he spends a lot of time talking about love. In five chapters, he uses the word love how many times? 26 in the New American Standard Translation. Look at chapter 3 and 4. I'm going to have to go quickly. I want to tell you, I didn't mention this to the first service, folks. I wrote this sermon as a first-person sermon. I was going to be John and talk this sermon. And I tried it, and I thought, man, I can't pull that off. So I rewrote it, and then I rewrote it again. And it is what it is. <laughs> okay? I'm going to just let John talk to us. I sat down and I thought, how do I take these two chapters and put them into a nice homiletical format? Three points and a couple of subpoints and an illustration. And I thought, I can't do it. John doesn't make it easy. So why try to improve on Scripture, huh? How about we just let John share it with us. So I'm going to share a considerable part of chapters 3 and 4 of 1 John with a few of my comments interspersed. Okay? 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared as yet what we will be. We know that when He appears, we will be like Him because we will see Him just as He is. The depth, the breadth, the amazing character of the love of God that reaches out and embraces us and brings it to Himself to be His children. Behold, how great a love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called His children. I want to point something out that might shake you up a little bit. All humanity, every person, male, female, young, old, educated or not, rich or poor, race, doesn't matter. Every human being is created by God and loved by God. So much that He sent His Son to redeem humanity. But the phrase children of God is reserved 
for the redeemed. When we say children of God as an expression for all humanity, it sounds good, but it's not biblical. The children of God are those who have been adopted by Him through Christ. See, he says, we're the children of God. And it is this very reason that causes the world not to know us. Why? Because they're not part of the family. He wants them to be part of the family. He died, his son died to make it possible for them to be part of the family. He tells you and me to share the gospel so that they will want to be a part of the family. But we have this tremendous love of God bestowed upon us that we are called the children of God. Adoption. I have known over my years many, many, many people who were adopted and loved by their adoptive parents. I remember sitting in a courtroom, a family court, with a, a, a single woman who was adopting a little bitty boy. Um, she had been babysitting him from his birth, and now he was about two and was being adopted. And when the judge signed the papers and gave him his new last name, we erupted in cheers. There were balloons and confetti, and the judge kind of looked at us like we were a bunch of crazies. But he was now a Thomas. And the adopted... Every bit as much a part of the family as the biological. That's what God... Paul tells us that God has adopted us. We are every bit as much His sons and daughters as is the begotten. That should shake you up a little bit. Not that we're divine. We're human. He's not. He's God. But we are His sons and His daughters. What love. What love. Now let me drop down to about verse 10. I'm skipping over some things here, but he, he, he says, by this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. He, he makes a distinction here, folks, between those who know Him and those who don't, between the redeemed and those who have not yet received Jesus. The children of God and the children of the devil, they're obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. What is the characteristic of the family? Love. Now, the characteristic of the family is that I go to church two Sundays a month. No. The characteristic of the family is that I say grace at dinner. No. The characteristic of the family is that I don't drink, cuss, swear. No. The characteristic of the family is love. He goes so far as to say that if we don't love the brethren, if we don't love our brother or sister, then we truly need to question whether we are a child of God or a child of the devil. Like I said, this can be a little bit harder, can't it? It's easy to go, I love God. I love to pray. I love to read Scripture. I love to gather with His people and sing songs of praise. I love to, I, I just love God. But when I look around in the pews, man, there's rich. And, and what do you say? He is so hard to love. <laughs> Sorry, Rich. Th Thursday's elders meeting. Someone just said, I love you, Grandpa. That's pretty good. Who was that? Oh, that's cool. Good job. Someone loves you, Rich. Oh, it's Carly up in the top. You know, we, we laugh, and I pick on Rich because Rich is lovable. Have you ever known someone who was a Christian, is a Christian, but you just, man, they just grind my gears. Man, they just irritate me no end. Oh, they are so hard to love. 
And John says, the characteristic of the family is love. And Rich, just so you know, over the 16 months I've been here, I've grown to really love and appreciate you. So don't go home wondering, does the preacher really not like me? <laughs> Rich knew this was coming. I did it to him first service too. You know, sometimes people are just difficult. Sometimes I'm difficult. Do you believe, did you know that? Did you know that sometimes it's hard to love your preacher? Ask my wife. She'll tell you. <laughs> there are days when she looks at me and thinks, why did I say I do 38 years ago? And I said, that's fair, because sometimes I look at you and say, why did I say I do 38 years ago? But here we are, 38 years later. Because in spite of the, the things that cause human relationships to at times be difficult, we have chosen what? To love one another. Remember, Lenski's definition of love, to always seek the well-being of the beloved. It doesn't say anything about how I feel. It talks about making a choice to pursue the well-being of the beloved. And when I pursue the well-being of the beloved, hey, the good feelings most likely will follow. Let me drop down to verses 14 to 18. I'll go ahead and say how I want to put this. First, love is life and love is lived. Hopefully I can make that make sense. Verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Therefore, what, what, what does he say? Not only is love the characteristic of the family, he says love is the very essence of life. The absence of love is death. The presence of love is life. We've passed out of death into life because the love that we have one for another. He says love for the who? The brethren, for the church, for the redeemed, for the family of God. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. That kind of goes back to the Sermon on the Mount when Jesus says, you've heard it said, you shall not kill, but I have said, don't even be angry. All right? And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. We know love by this. He laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. He goes on and defines that. And I found it interesting. I, Rich and I did not coordinate, but I talked with Rich after first service because what Rich said about the old King James usage of the word charity... Uh, that, that, that's the old word for love. But using the new uh, definitions of these words, to link love and charity is a good thing because John does it here 2,000 years ago. Hear what he says. Whoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him. That's a very descriptive image, isn't it? I have goods, you have need, but I close my heart toward you. John says, how does the love of God abide in him? Because the love of God sent his son, he laid down his life. Little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. You see, this is why I say love is life. We've come from death into life. Love is its very essence. But love is also something that is lived. It's not just a word, but it is action. It is a verb. It is lived. The only thing that came to my mind with this is how sometimes our words are so empty. And I thought of a, a, an abusive husband who would, who would batter and beat his wife and finally she packs her bags and she's leaving and he gets all teary-eyed and he says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, I'll never do it again. I love you. 
And she comes back in the house and unpacks her bags. And three weeks later, she's battered and she's bruised. And she packs her bags. And as she's going out the door, he's all teary-eyed. And he says, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. I love you. And the cycle continues and continues and continues. It is easy to say, I love you. It's harder to love. John says, oh, so very beautifully, little children, let us not love with word or with tongue, but in deed and truth. Well, my sermon has gone on far longer than the first service. I still have quite a bit to cover, so let me go through very quickly with you, if you'll allow in chapter 4 of 1 John, beginning at verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation or the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God abides in Him and He in God. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love and the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in Him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as He is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. We love because He first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. There's a whole other sermon in those verses. First of all, just take note that God is love. Now that doesn't mean that God is just some kind of nondescript, ambiguous feeling floating through the galaxy. It's that in God, if you want to understand what love is, look at God. Hear His Word. See His heart. God defines what love is. He also tells us that we love because God first loved us. It's not that we said, oh yes, God. No, God said, oh yes, humanity created in my image, rebelled against my will, but I seek the well-being of my beloved humanity and I send my Son. God loved us. And because He has loved us, we can love Him and we can love one another. And He says that's an absolute essential. Because if you say, I love God, but hate your brother, you're a liar. How can you love God whom you've not seen? if you don't love your brother who you can see. Maybe, just maybe, there was still a touch of the old son of thunder in John, the apostle of love, because he sure doesn't pull any punches in this little letter. He doesn't give us a lot of wiggle room, wiggle room. He says the way of the kingdom is love. The characteristic of the family is love. The essence of love is God Himself. God loved us, so we ought to love one another, and we ought to love God. 
I'm going to close with one of my favorite illustrations. I've used it here before, and I'll use it here again because I just think it's so powerful. It comes from the life of Martin Luther, the 16th century German reformer. He was still living as a, as a Catholic monk in a monastery, and he was in his, his cell, his room, a very small area, and he is wrestling internally with spiritual matters, and he's cursing the devil. If you ever read Martin Luther, be prepared. He uses very, what we would call colorful language. He's a great cusser. And he's cursing the devil in the middle of the night. And his, his uh, spiritual mentor, Johann Stoffitz, uh, comes into him and he says, Martin, my dear Martin, what is it that you want? And Luther, with tears and with passion, says, I want a God I can love. I want a God who loves me. Seemed Luther had never experienced a God who loved him. Only an angry God of eternal judgment ready to bestow wrath upon him. And Luther says, I want a God I can love. And he defines it by saying, a God who loves me. And Stoffitz takes his crucifix from around his neck and lays it in Luther's hand. And he says, then my dear Martin, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. Do you understand the depth and the breadth of God's love for you? Do you understand God loves you? We teach that to our children, don't we? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Are those just words? Do you understand how much He loves you? Look to Christ. Look to the cross. He loves you. Do you love Him? Do you love Him with every fiber of your being? With all your heart? With all your soul? With all your mind? With all your strength? Do you love Him? And... Hmm. Take a minute to look around, either physically or literally or symbolically. Do you love your brother and your sister? The men and women who are sitting around you this morning. Not just in your own pew, but three pews back or three pews forward. Do you love the brothers and the sisters? who are the family of God. That's what the greatest commandment is about. Love God. Love your neighbor. Simple as that. But sometimes hard. We're going to sing this song, and if you have never experienced that deep love of God, what His sacrifice of the cross is about, we invite you to come forward as we sing to be embraced, to be enveloped in His love. And as we depart, along with the Apostle John, the Apostle of love, I want to encourage you, let's go forward and love one another. Would you stand as we sing?
You may be seated, and Rich is going to lead us to the table where Jesus invites us to share with him. John 13, verses 34 and 35, Jesus says, So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. I came across a story this week, and it kind of reminded me of my, my high school days um, when I thought I should learn to speak Spanish. And uh, I took it for one or two years, I don't remember, but uh, my knowledge has definitely faded, but gone, get past... Uh, Buenos dias, me llamo Ricardo. Como esta usted? Por favor, gracias. I'm done. It's over. <laughs> Unfortunately, I never kept up the effort. And, uh, and even now, I can, I can say that I want to learn the language, but that doesn't mean a lot if I don't want to put in the time and the, and the effort and the follow-through so that I really do learn to speak it. Jesus says to uh, love one another. And in this passage, he tells the disciples to love another. By doing so, people will know that uh, they are his disciples. Jesus knows actions reveal our true beliefs and our motivations. Jesus encourages followers to live out their faith and loving, loving one another well. He understands that it does not help people to preach a gospel of grace and tell them that God loves them if we ignore their various needs. We're called to truly show Jesus' love to the people around us. Then they'll know that we really believe in God's uh, love and good news for the world. To serve as effective disciples and to point others to uh, faith in Christ, our witness really begins with the way we treat others. Please remember God's love and that he sent his one and only son to die for us. We just keep this in mind as we partake of these emblems that represent his body and, and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we just uh, thank you so much for showing us your, your unconditional love and uh, your forgiveness by sending your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for our salvation. I pray that our lives will be faithful to you and, and honor you as uh, your disciples. And please help us to be mindful of Jesus' sacrifice as, as we partake of these uh, emblems that represent Christ's body and blood. We give you all the praise and glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're so happy that you were able to join us today, either in person or online. Um, just a few announcements as we dismiss. Please stay in your pew until you are dismissed, and please do not congregate in the narthex. This is my repeated message of this week. Oh, also have a great week. Would you please stand and sing with us? <laughs> <laughs> 